Good evening, good evening, good evening. Yeah. Tuesday night, butt naked truth with your with your host, Bishop Shaolin Abrams. Yeah. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Lord, I give you praise. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Lord, I give you praise. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, I give you praise. Lord, I give you praise. Lord, I give you praise. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. Let me tell you something. I just want to welcome everybody, you know, because I'm trying to tell you right here, right now, that God, let me tell you something. You can listen to everybody in anything talking about God is up to something, but I'm trying to tell you, God is really up to something. And it's not what other people think that God is up to. See, folks is waiting for, you know, money to drop out of the sky or, you know, walking into that car dealership and they say, oh, you don't need no money down or, you know, here's the keys and all these other things. But I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you what God is up to. You know what God is up to? God is up to opening the doors to the kingdom of heaven. Listen to me now. Only for those people who are out there winning souls to Christ. That's right, I said it. Let me tell you something. If you're not winning souls to Christ, listen to me, listen to me carefully. You do not work for God. You are self-employed. <clears throat> listen. If building churches, these great big edifices, if having uh, uh, five churches, uh, 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 one church in five locations, and by the way, that's the that that's the statement, not one God, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, but uh, one church, multiple locations. But anyway, uh. Thank you, Lord. I mean, I, I, I am so dumbfounded today because people are, 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 are getting, getting all excited and all hyped up. And we know with the recent events that's going on with all this, this stuff, this killing and, and now all lives matter. We already, we're not going to, we, we're not going to keep throwing salt in that wound because I, I've said it, and that's it. I'm not going to keep on belaboring that point because everybody knows how I feel about that. And, and, and you know, quit showing me a, 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 a black man and a white cop in Walmart praying because no, no, that's just no. Let's not, let, let's don't even go there. You know what I mean? And I said this today, and I'm going to move on, that if a, if a black man goes on a shooting spree and kills a whole bunch of black people, yeah, he might get some time. Yeah, he might get some time, absolutely. But if he kills just one white person, trust me, the death penalty is on the line. So yes, justice is blind, because it's just us. And that's coming straight from <clears throat> the horse's mouth, Bishop Shaolin Abrams, butt naked truth. Thor International Fellowship of Home Churches and Ministries, the House of Restoration. Listen to me. I'm trying to tell you. The Bible says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me explain some folks. <clears throat> you can continue to pray, and prayer is good. That's why they say push. Praying is something happens. But guess what? The Bible says, just don't be hearers of the word but be doers. Oh my God. Why you think the LGBT can get anything they want? Because not only are they standing up for what they believe in, huh? They know that there's power in numbers. 
Listen to me. This is the, the see, nobody wants to hear the truth. You know, the kids say keeping it 100. Not 100, but 100. You know? No, I'm not. No, I ain't going to be swagging with no with no uh, uh, jerseys and hat. Tur no, I'm just telling you right here, right now, that we have to take a stand. Listen here. This is the Bible tells me that this right here. Look, this right here. It says after we've done all we can to stand. Stand, therefore. So that's that. That's that. Time for, we, we teach here. It's not preaching time. I ain't going to preach. You know, I, I'm going to teach you the word of God. We, 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 we uh, 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 teach a lot of scripture. So if you don't want to hear God's word in its entirety, then this is not the place for you to be. I'm just going to tell you right now. Get your Bibles. Pen, pad, thesaurus, uh, 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 the, 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 uh, uh, concordance, Bible dictionary, get all the tools you need because we, we're studying the Bible. This is all part of, uh, uh, uh hermeneutics. See, the Bible says, how can you, Understand the word lest we have what a preacher, but more so a teacher. See. And I, I, I'm going to I'm going to do my best to give you what God has given me in this allotted time that that I have, you know, and, and with that being said, I want to just thank uh, each and every one of you who joined us tonight. Thank for those those people who continue to, to uh, join us and support us. You know, we thank you. Uh, we thank um, MKSPCG, My Kings TV. We also thank uh, Recovery Through Deliverance and Restoration Television. We also thank the House of Restoration, as well as Thor International Fellowship of Home Churches and Ministry. We thank each and every one of you so much. But let us pray so we can get right into this work of God let me tell you something. It, it's something going on here. People don't want to hear the truth. See, they don't want to hear the truth. They don't. They rather for you to tell a whole bunch of lies to them, because that way, that way they they they're not responsible. But once you hear the truth, you are responsible. After that, Hallelujah. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Father God, I come to you this evening in prayer and in thanksgiving. To give you all the praise, honor, and glory, Father God, that you and you alone deserve. Father God, I want to first and foremost say thank you for giving me of all of my sins, God, past, present, and future, as well as all the offenses that I have committed against others, God, intentionally and unintentionally, Father God. So as I pray these prayers before you, that they will not fall upon deaf ear. Father God, I just want to say thank you, Father God, for opening the hearts and the minds of your people tonight as we the, the, as we just get into your word as we just continue father god to get to get down to the nitty gritty god as we get down with the get down god as we get down and in, 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 into the in, into the butt naked truth of it all god so that your that you that your your, your children won't be like bays being tossed to and fro by every wind and wave of doctrine put forth by the cunning and trickery of crafty men and women, God. We thank you, Father God. Now, God, I just ask that you just just, just open my mind, God, and reveal to me those mysteries that you wish for me to know so that I can give them to your children. So, Father God, that we can have ammunition for our spiritual guns. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and give thanks. Amen. And amen and amen hallelujah mm. before i um get into tonight's lesson god put this word uh, on my on my heart uh, uh this evening and i i have to do what god has called me to do uh but 
I just want you to listen. It's it's not just for for you, it's for everyone, myself included. Understand that we here at the House of Restoration and the Butt Naked Truth. Let me just say this to you all. The Lord does not endorse nor support false prophets, preachers, teachers, or leaders, period. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, he says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It also goes on to say in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5, it says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying that I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now, it's always God's desire, listen to me closely, that those who proclaim the gospel be righteous. Yet, when an evil or immoral person preaches his word, God can still work in the hearts of those who receive his word with commitment to Christ. God doesn't endorse an unrighteous preacher of the gospel, but he will endorse biblical truth in those who accept it in faith. Understand that the power of working miracles has no necessary connection with piety. Success as the world counts it, is not a criterion of one's knowledge of Christ in relation to him. So understand, God cannot and will not endorse an unrighteous preacher of the gospel, even though he may be operating in the miraculous. This is where the multitudes are deceived. They think that because there are signs and wonders performed in a man's ministry, that could be a woman of God as well, that he is or she is of God, that God is well pleased with them, or that God is endorsing their ministry. But guess what? Nothing can be further from the truth. Now, Christ blasted in them in Matthew chapter 7, all the false professors, those who profess Christ, who would do things in his name yet not do the will of his father. In his statements, he made it plain and clear that he does not accept shadows without substance. He doesn't endorse any ministry that calls him Lord, yet lives to please self. So like I said in my earlier statement, if you're not winning souls to Christ, you don't work for God. You're self-employed. He made it very evident that the acid test for every ministry or every Christian life, the decisive test of being in the kingdom of God is obedience to the will of the Father. Now, I know this is going to be a hard pill for folks to follow, and I throw bricks every time I'm on the air. In Matthew 7, 21 and 23, he said, Now everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we cast out devils, and in thy name have done wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Here, Christ emphasized the sharp contrast between the mere talkers 
and the doers of his will. There were those who were calling him Lord and Master who were professing subjection to him because of their mere profession. They were consequently claiming admittance into the kingdom of heaven, yet they were destitute of piety, holiness, or being separated unto him. Their outward profession of Christianity, however remarkable it was, was not enough to bring them to heaven. That is, without being totally committed to the truth and righteousness as revealed in his word. One thing that is definitely overlooked in the Christian circles of today is this fact. Ministerial success is not the standard by which to judge one's relation to Christ. So in other words, just because they got a big congregation, huh? 30,000, 5,000, one church, multiple locations. Those are the ones who are calling Jesus Lord and yet have not gotten the bad tree rooted up and the good tree planted in its place. They don't have the hearty love to Christ nor a true faith in him, nor do they have a true concern to preach his gospel, advance his glory, and promote his kingdom and interest. You know what God's greatest desire is? His greatest desire is that none shall perish. Where are you? You get mad at your Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and the Nation of Islam because they out there. But where are you? See? They can be likened unto Roman soldiers at the whipping post who put a gorgeous robe on Christ, bend the knee, and then say, Hail, King of the Jews. That is, after they had just scourged and whipped him, we want you to notice one word that Jesus used in his discourse, which is rather shocking, and that word is many. This is what he said. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Now what he was saying is this. Many will call him Lord and Master. Many will profess subjection to him. Many will call upon his name. Many would make use of his name in public ministry. Many would make mention of his name in their sermons. And many would seek to cover themselves, take away their reproach, gain credit with or get into the goodwill of the people by being called by his name. But the sad thing about this is that it would be the few who would show a hearty love to seek Christ, seek unto, look unto, commit themselves to, trust in, rely on, and believe on him for righteousness, salvation, and eternal life. It would be the few who would be faithful dispensers of his word, declare his whole counsel, keep back nothing profitable to the souls of men, not be afraid of the faces of men, and speak the gospel boldly with all sincerity, or seek to please him rather than men. Speak the gospel with all sincerity, or seek to please him rather than men. Resultantly, many professing obedience will find themselves self-deceived. It will be the few who will be counted as faithfully obedient. In that day, the last day, the great day of the Lord or the day of judgment when the secrets of the hearts are made manifest and everyone's true colors are shown for what they are, pretenders as well as the true ministers will be made manifest. The many had great success in their ministry. They were involved in three of the highest services rendered the Christian cause, prophesying, casting out devils, and working miracles. Yet, Jesus called them workers of iniquity. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we what? Not prophesied in, their, in thy name? Have in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? 
And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that were iniquity. What Jesus is stating here is rather shocking. He's actually saying that workers of iniquity can prophesy, teach the word, write excellent books, preach excellent services, give good advice, cast out devils, perform wonderful works or miracles. <coughs> they can make an external profession of Christianity, yet walk unworthy of its precepts, being lukewarm or indifferent to Christ in their hearts, while loving the world and its pleasures. And in spite of their claims to intimacy with Christ, they're evildoers. Evil doers who are performing great works in his name. I keep telling folks this they ain't like Dracula. This is not a Dracula story. Where they can't be up in the church. They hold up a cross and they go they go back. No, that's that's fallacy. It is to be understood from this passage of scripture that not all miracles, uh oh, are of divine origin. And not all miracle workers are are divinely sanctioned. So those folks that are doing all of that may not be from God. When we examine the meaning of the word miracle and see that one definition states a supernatural power that is at hand, we have the reason that the power may or may not be divine. It can be demonic. Fervent gospel preaching, having a zeal for righteousness, and operating under a powerful anointing can all be the workings of Satan. Huh. Jesus will say to the many who deceive the multitudes with their phenomenal preaching, their phenomenal signs and wonderful ministries, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, one way of interpreting this is by saying, I never approved your conduct. I never regarded you as my servant or my friend. I never acknowledged your ministry as one of mine. Who would be included in this I never knew you group? Mm. Let me take a sip of water while I tell you this. Thank you, Lord. They would be all the preachers all the pastors, all the bishops, all the apostles, or whatever you're calling yourself today, or individual believers who were unholy in heart, unrighteous in conduct, or held the truth in unrighteousness while preaching the pure and holy doctrines of the Bible. Depart from me. Could there be more terrible or dreadful words found to be spoken by God to any man or woman than these? I never knew you. In other words, Christ would say that these many were never real in their relationship with him. They didn't build their life on his word. They didn't build their churches on his word. And they didn't hear the word to do it. Instead... They claim to believe the Bible while at the same time supporting things contrary to it. In spite of what the Bible says, they walk contrary to it. Listen, you can't steal. You can't uh, 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 do things that are contrary to God and think it's okay. They ignored God's word to go forward in sin. They constantly reasoned around their sinful lifestyle, looking for loopholes to cover it up. Jesus made it plain and clear that the many would be successful in their ministry. They would surely operate in their gifts. Many would be deluded as a result. There are two kinds of professors in Christianity today, and I want you to hear me and hear me well. There are those who acknowledge Jesus as Lord of their lives 
And then there are those who acknowledge Jesus as Lord and back it up with obedience. Read again what Jesus said here in this passage of scripture. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Here it is, he laid down the law. No one gets into heaven without living a life of continual obedience to his word. This is the real acid test that marks all men and women as being true or false. Are they doing the will of the Father? Are they glorifying his Son, or are they bringing glory to themselves? Don't forget, Balaam, Caiaphas, King Saul, all prophesied, while even Judas cast out devils. But they were not pleasing in God's sight. They did what they wanted rather than the will of the Father. They were actually a law unto themselves. Whenever you see a minister, a bishop, an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, or even a ministry that is a, in a law unto themselves, watch out. Warning sirens should immediately be going off in your spirit. These are a part of the many of whom Jesus warned us. Our prayer is that your spiritual eyes will be open and that you will grow in discernment as far as who is true and who is false that is ministering in Christ's name in our day and time. They think that they shall go to heaven because they have been of good repute among professors of religion or Christianity, having kept fast and given alms and have been preferred in the church as if this would atone for their reigning pride, worldliness, and sensuality in want of love to God and man. Listen to me. A great truth pro proclaimed. The religion of Christ is to be practiced. For the teaching of Jesus are understood as they are put into practice. They are only honored as they are put into practice. And let me tell you something. That's why as as we study this word, you know, as we study, listen, I'm, I'm trying to tell you something real. As we study, look, as we study this word, see, this is my Bible. See, as we study this word, we have to know how to do what? Rightly divine that word. See? But when we study the word, as we get into the night's lesson, These are some of the things that we need when we're studying the word. First of all, first of all, of course, we need the word of God. And I suggest in studying you get a King James version, a new King James, and or, or uh, uh, you know, um, an amplified Bible. That's how I study. Because, you know, you have the King James for the foundation the New King James for, uh, uh, you know, to understand. And then the Amplified, it breaks it down even better. But also, when you're studying God's word, we're talking about rightly dividing the word of God, how we really study God's word. This is Bible study time. A lot of people don't even know this. We also need a Bible concordance. Now, the concordance features an alphabetical listing of every word in the scripture. Following each word is a citation of its occurrences by chapter and verse, with a brief quotation from each scripture text. Most large concordances include a Hebrew and Greek lexicon, which is a, de a definition of words, from which the English version was translated. Next, so first we need a Bible, like I said, whether it be King James, New King James, Amplify, Bible Concordance. Next we need a Bible Dictionary or an atlas, a Bible atlas, which provides a concise description of people, places, and subjects of the scriptures. It helps to give a panoramic view of the words of God. Next, 
we need an English dictionary. Now, much of the misunderstanding and difficulty of scripture or, or scriptural study may be avoided by simply learning the correct meaning and pronunciation of English words. Now, a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary is indispensable for studying the Word of God. Next, we need a scripture commentaries. Now, understand that a commentary is precisely as the name implies, a collection of explanatory comments on scriptures, usually verse by verse, by notable Bible teachers. There are many good scriptural uh, commentaries available which reflect the insight of great, honest uh, biblical theologians. Unfortunately, much has also been written by those who deny or demean the apostolic teachings of the scriptures. So sound judgment should be exercised in the selection of commentaries and other written aids. A man of God who believes the scriptures without reservation or apology will gladly recommend scripturally and doctrinally sound authors. Now, how exactly do we interpret the scriptures correctly? First of all, we must remember that the scriptures are the sacred word of God. See, The scriptures are the inspired word of God. So the Holy Spirit will lead the true believer to study his word with reverence and respect, of accepting what the word of God says by faith. Now, some of the passages in the scriptures are difficult to understand, but should be received without criticism or doubt and with the pure conscience before God. Because as, we, as we'll learn later on, the Bible is broken into three in the three stages, uh, literally, uh, 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 allegorically, and figuratively. So you definitely need the Holy Spirit when we are when we are studying the Word of God. You just can't open the Bible and think you're just going to tackle it like any other book you read. The Bible says in Exodus chapter three verse five, then He said, "Do not draw near to this place." Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. The Bible also goes on to say, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Now remember that the English grammar is very important when studying scripture. We got to also remember to exercise proper diction when reading the scriptures. Why? Because the proper pronunciation of words will convey a more accurate meaning as to what the scriptures are truly saying and the impact that God meant for them to have on the text. You should always have a dictionary available for reference to unfamiliar words. Like one of the biggest words. I think in the dictionary, people read over and over, and I tell you what, a lot of people don't even know what it means. Propit propitionary or propitination or, 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 or I, can't, I can't even pronounce it right. Pro, propit propitiation. Now, a lot of people don't, they, they read it, they see it, but a lot of people don't even know what it means. But propitiation means it means to satisfy or to take the place of. See, I know that because I've, I've, I've looked it up and I know it over and over because that's one word that we read over and we don't even we don't even bother to look it up to know what it means. So remember to observe the punctuation marks in scriptures because often some scriptures end in the middle of the text. Paragraphs dealing with a single subject may extend from one chapter to another. Periods, commas, colons, all those kind of things are some of the tools of the English language used in writing to express the structure 
of the author's message. I, I just wanted just to share this with a lot of y'all that just joined us. This is Bible study. This is Bible study. So, you know, that's what we're doing. We're studying the word of God. How are you going to, listen, I don't care what size your gun is, whether it be a 22 or, or, or 357. If you don't have any bullets in it, it's useless. So we're we're, we're 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 getting some ammunition for our spiritual guns here. Now remember that the scriptures have chapter and verse designation. Now the New King James version of the scriptures have clearly defined features with numbered chapters and verse designation. Now although such divisions are not in the Hebrew or Greek manuscripts, they bear the undeniable approval of the Holy Spirit and almost without an exception. Now some quotations are taken from the New King James Scriptures and being used in our everyday life. Its distinctive chapter and verse style is natural for easier memorization and permits scripture references easier to locate for preaching, teaching, and personal witnessing. The value and blessing of chapter and verse divisions is unquestionable. However, when reading the scriptures, always properly observe the punctuation marks. Artificially pausing after each verse fragments the natural flow of the text and will adversely affect the level of comprehension. And next, remember the harmony of the scriptures. The word of God reveals only one system of theology and truth. Now, because of this unity in the scriptures, all doctrine in the word of God supports the whole truth. And since God is not the author of confusion, correct interpretation demands that the scriptures augment and not contradict one another. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Romans 3 and 28 goes on to say, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Then James 2 and 17 ends it like this. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So faith without works is dead. Mm. Okay. So we can pray in faith, but if there's nothing behind that, then it's dead. Okay. I'm going to leave that alone. Is there a contradiction in the scriptures? Remember that no contradiction is possible if the true believer rightly divides the word of truth. Who's right, Paul or James? They're both right. Paul declares man's justification before God to be by faith alone. James deals with man's testimony before the world, explaining that inward faith is demonstrated to men by the outward evidence of God of good works. Now, Paul addresses the true believer's standing in the eyes of God. James speaks of his standing in the eyes of men. Now, the scriptures reveal a progressive revelation. Listen to me good. Mark 4 and 28 says this, For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. So scriptural the, the, uh, theology is developed from its infancy in the Old Testament to its maturity in the New Testament. Prophetic mysteries and doctrinal truths are unfolded as the word of God progresses to its full unveiling in the completed New Testament revelation. Listen. Remember that scripture 
interprets scripture. So, what are you saying, Bishop? Well, easy. If you can't find it anywhere in the word of God, it ain't true. Folks talking all this junk, you know, want to talk about, you know, the Jezebel spirit and all this other kind of, where's the scripture? Come on. Scripture interprets scripture. You just can't talk for an hour, two hours, and you talk about the word of God, and there's no scripture. Remember, the best commentary on scripture is scripture. See? To have an overall understanding of the word of God, to whom they are written, what each says, and their order in scriptures and it is invaluable in discerning their influence upon the whole scriptural theology. It has been wisely said that the best commentary on scriptures is scriptures. That's why I say it all the time. God said it. I believe it. That's that. Because what? The old confirms the new. And the new confirms the old. That's why a lot of uh, these, what we call the apocrypha, these Bibles, if you if you were here a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the books that were not in the Bible because they they were just they just stood alone. They could be they, they they couldn't verify nothing from nothing. They were just out of the air. And guess what? They're in the Roman Catholic Bible today. See? And a lot of other scriptures. So to find a clear passage, sometimes one must go through an obscure passage. Understand, no scripture passage is rightly divided which contradicts the teaching of clear and established scripture. Ambiguous passages with more than one choice of meaning must be interpreted to harmonize with unquestionable scriptural doctrine on the subject. Look what the Bible says. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So generally, no doctrine should be established upon scriptures which are unclear, purely historical, or transitory in nature. Suppose new light derived uh, uh, from vague text should be examined very carefully, remembering the old adjective. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's probably not true. That's why you continue to hear me say some of the scriptures over and over and over again. Because once again, Genesis to Revelation, that's it. 66 books, that's it. See? Scripture must be interpreted in context with the whole text. See, that's what we call people, it's called twisting scripture. See, simply put, the part is interpreted by the whole. No passage which is lifted out of its context to support some foreign theological concept may be said to be rightly divided. And that's what you're hearing today. Folks take two or three scriptures and, and, and put them anywhere, anywhere they want. And I'm going to give you one, and you can get mad all you want, but you can check it out for yourself. The Bible does not say that God will not 
put on you more than you can handle or bear. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All across America and every denomination, from Episcopalians to non-denominational, you hear that. Oh, God, I never put on me more than I can handle. The, the script, I said, I, I have... I have gone to to numerous preachers, numerous bishops, numerous apostles. Show that to me in the word of God. I'm going to tell you what scripture that they are twisting. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to go to it. So, because I, listen, anything I say, I could prove it to you in the word of God. 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, I hope y'all went into uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, but we'll we'll come, we'll do go through that on Saturday. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and, 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 and look at verse, look at verse, uh, look at verse number 13. It says, I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Now let me tell you something, what every preacher every ha has told me, they told me what that scripture, oh, that's what that says. I said, no, don't say that. I said, here's, it says no, what you can bear. It says temptation. Let's look, let's go to the dictionary. Let's take the word temptation. Okay. Temptation means to entice. Or to, or, 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 or to, or, or enticement. Bear. It means weight or weighty. Now, if, if any of y'all could show me that in the scripture, I'll believe it. But I know it's not there. But we say things without checking the word out, rightly dividing the word of God. Anyway, there's more, but I, I'm not going to do that today. You must also... Note the general subject of the context as I'm wrapping this up. Scriptures, which are applied to far-fetched doctrines, not even remotely connected to the general theme of the text, are heresies and should be discarded. Because first of all, you must identify to whom the text is directed. Now, there are three distinct groups that are identified in the scriptures. Number one is Israel, which are the Jews, the Gentiles, which are the believers, and the New Testament church, what is us, okay? Now, many prophecies, promises, and covenants are speaking to one group only. And misappropriation of these scriptural passages have led to some grave scriptural and doctrinal errors among some preachers, some bishops, some apostles, some pastors, some teachers, and even some believers who have interpreted the word of God wrong. The Bible says, give no offense either to the Jew or to the Greeks or to the church of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. So I'm going to stop right there because we're going to get into a new thought, which is how to, the basic fundamentals of how to interpret the scriptures. So I'm going to stop right there because, like I said, that gets into another, another train of thought. But I'm telling you, this is the butt naked truth. I, I'm throwing bricks. Every time I come on, on the air, I'm throwing bricks. See? 
I'm throwing spiritual bricks. The reason why I'm doing that is because, listen, I can't save you. Your mother can't save you. Bishop so-and-so can't. Apostle so-and-so. Chief, no, can't save you. You can't even save you. How about that one? See? It, it's time out for all this foolishness. People want to people wanna come up and they want to, uh, 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 first of all, let me tell you something. You cannot, you cannot put Jesus on something, right, and call it holy. And just because you say in Jesus' name, make it holy. I don't care what you say, you can't do it. Because only Jesus has that power. Only God has that power. We don't have that power. We can't make nothing holy. The Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy, even in all your conduct. I can't make nothing uh, 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 holy because I put Jesus' name on it. See? Folks endorsing all these things. That's why, let me tell you something that I found very fascinating about this whole this whole um this whole shooting and all this stuff and once again I, I don't condone uh murder killing and all that kind of I don't condone that but I found one thing interesting is that I saw all these preachers some big names some not they all on YouTube all on Facebook all on all these social medias but not one not one of them called a press conference. Not even your not even your mainstream ones that got all this power. And definitely not and I'm just saying it is it, the truth, whether you want to believe it or not. Not one, not even one white preacher came out there. One, you ain't gonna see the Paula White, you're not gonna see the Joe Osteen, you're not gonna see uh uh uh, uh your your boy Rod Parsley, Mike Murdoch, none of them. You definitely didn't see Creflo. You definitely didn't see uh, T.D. Jakes. You definitely didn't see Ivy Hiller. You def none of the none, none. But they got mad because Farrakhan came out and said something. Really? I don't endorse Farrakhan, but I'm just saying, y'all get mad because the Jehovah's Witnesses are in our community evangelizing. You get mad because the Mormons are out there in our communities evangelizing. You mad because the nation are out there in our community evangelizing. Don't get mad. Do something about it. Oh, I know what it is. Oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bishop. I'm sorry, Apostle. I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm sorry, Prophet. Uh, uh, you, you, you feel that if you do that, folks are not going to come. Uh, to your church anymore and ain't gonna give you no tithes and offering no more but i'm gonna tell you what don't nobody I, i'm not i'm not a hireling see i work for god see so whether you support me or endorse me or, or anything like that i'm still gonna stand up for righteousness that's what hey that's what this word is for look at here that's what this is for for what for, for righteousness, to teach us about righteousness. But I guess that doesn't matter when it comes to dollars and cents. More Folks are more interested in their numbers. Like, it's so funny. You have some people that say numbers don't mean anything, which is a crock-a-doo-doo. Crock I said it, crock-a-doo-doo. It is. Because we know this power in numbers. What? What do you think unity is? The Bible says that when what? Two or more come together and gather in my name. He said, they are dwelling in this. Isn't that numbers? My God, boy, I tell you what. Boy, just, just, if people just, boy, if you believe, let me tell you something. If you believe, it's just so much craziness that's going on there. Folks just believe. That's why it was so easy. For Jim Jones, for all y'all who are old enough to remember Jim Jones. That's why it was so easy for Jim Jones to take a thousand black folks. Yeah, I said it. 
a thousand black folks to their death. Because you what? You didn't check the scriptures. I don't care. Uh, this is the butt naked truth. See? I, I Anybody who knows me know that, first of all, I ain't no punk, first and foremost. See? I, I, that, that I'm not. I wasn't a yes man when I was out there ripping and running in them streets. And I definitely ain't no yes man now. I only answered to Christ. See, because listen, it's for God I live and for God I'll die. Because I would rather be what? Uncomfortable in Christ than to be comfortable with Satan. Why? Because I know that if you're not winning souls to Christ or for Christ, then you do not work for God. You are self-employed. That's it. That's all. Get mad all you want. But the only one that's gone, that got mad and one that got hollered is, is the one who got hit. So join me again. I thank you for your time. Join me on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock once again for the Butt Naked Truth as we continue about the basic fundamentals of how to what? Interpret the scriptures. And I just want to say thank you for all those who continue to support us here at the, the, the House of Restoration, as well as Thor International Fellowship of Home Churches and Ministries. And we just want to say thank you uh, for supporting us, Recovery Through Deliverance and Restoration Television. We thank you so much for your patience, and we just thank you for just listening and obeying God. And I thank you. See you on Sunday evening, if God will. God bless, and good night.